all together. Now, there are some special common names of substituents. These were basically names that were sort of invented before the IUPAC, and many of them, they were trying to make sort of a systematic naming system. And then the IUPAC sort of took it, cleaned it up, and made it the modern IUPAC systematic naming system. Okay, so you are going to need to memorize these names. These names are often found in common names. They're often found in catalogs. They're used a lot. So it is important that you know these, even though there are, as I'm going to show you, alternative IUPAC systematic names. I also want to point out that the IUPAC basically initially tried to stamp these names out but you know how human nature is. Some people would just use them, continue to use them. And so the IUPAC eventually surrendered and does actually accept these in IUPAC names. In fact, actually, the current state of it is that they probably prefer that you use this name rather than the complicated systematic name. Although, again, not everybody agrees, and so you're going to see everything. Okay, so let's start here. So the first kind of carbon group that we could have attached to a, to a parent chain. So we'd have a parent chain, and then this would be attached. Would just be a straight chain of carbons of a certain length. This was called the normal chain. It's just a normal way, right? Normal to attach carbons all in a straight line. So therefore, when it was a substituent, they called it normal and then the substituent name. So for example, three carbons would be prop, we would have a YL ending, and this would be the normal propyl. You just attach on the end here, it's three carbons in a chain. Similarly with butyl, normal butyl. Now, what you're going to learn is that organic chemists like to abbreviate things to save space and time. So eventually normal became abbreviated as N. And so, for example, this is N-butyl. N is just an abbreviation for the word normal, and there are people who still use the entire world and call it normal butyl. Okay? More interesting, more complicated, and perhaps more confusing at first, are what we call the isogroups. Now, the isogroups were identified as something special because they have this forked tail where the chain comes, it comes, it comes, and at the very end, the carbon right before the last carbon, the second to last carbon, has a chain going one way and then a branch to another chain going that way, both of the chains ending in a CH3 group. So we have this forked tail. This turned out to be a structure because of the way that many natural molecules are built in biological systems. This structure appeared in a lot of molecules. So they came up with a special name for when they had these kinds of branches. They called this structure right here an isogroup. Iso meaning same, implying that we have basically two of the two chains that are basically the same right on top of each other. So this, CH with a CH3 and a CH3 and then something else attached, that is the iso group. What they then did was they said, well, we see a whole bunch of these chains of different lengths ending in an iso group. So those would have CH2 groups starting from the central isocarbon going out and then attached to our parent. So we might, for example, have two CH2s, then this CH, CHC, CH3. So in order to indicate sort of just a generic number of CH2 groups, in addition to the iso group, they put CH2 parentheses N, where N would just be a whole number. All right, so that's our general iso group. 
Then what they did was they said, we're going to name this group as an ISO group and we're going to call the parent the total number of carbons, including all the CH2s plus the three carbons of the ISO. So the total number of carbons will be the same as N from the CH2s plus three. And then we're gonna look that up on the table. And if it's four, we're gonna call it but. And if it's six, we're gonna call it hex and so forth. So let me show you how this plays out then. So the smallest ISO group is just the ISO by itself where N equals zero. There are no other CH2s and you're just attra attached directly to the center of that ISO group. So if N equals zero, then we have a total of zero plus three, three carbons. So this would be a propyl. So therefore this is called isopropyl. The IUPAC for this would be one methyl ethyl. In contrast, we could have one CH2 group attached. So N would be one. In that case, then we would have one CH2 plus the three for the, but, uh, the uh, sorry, for the ISO. So one plus three is four. So we would call that a butyl. So this would be isobutyl. Notice how there are one, two, three, four carbons in this total group. Notice also how we are attached directly to the CH2 not directly to the ISO itself, and so on. So we could essentially generate infinite different ISO substituents just by changing the number of CH2s. But typically, we don't really go above um, two CH2s, which would be five total carbons, so isopentyl. So isopentyl is a thing. Um, it's not used very often anymore, but it is a thing. Okay, there are two other special butyl groups. The first one is this group where if we imagine having a straight chain of four carbons, I didn't make it straight, I should have, but having a chain of four carbons and instead of attaching on the end in the normal way, we attach to the second carbon. So this is called secondary butyl, sec butyl. We could also have four carbons where we had one carbon in the middle, CH3 is branching off, so it's sort of like putting another branch on the ISO. But then to do that, you're gonna have four total carbons. So that ended up being called tertiary butyl because we're gonna see, or we see that we're attached to a tertiary carbon. That carbon has three other carbon groups attached besides that. So tertiary butyl, tert butyl or T butyl. There are just a couple other special groups. The first one is this one. This is a carbon in the middle, CH3 groups all around, but then on one of the CH3 groups, we take off a hydrogen and we attach it to something. So now we have five carbons. So can you see how this is sort of like another level we're kind of building up from ISO. ISO, we have two CH3s. Tert butyl, we have three CH3s. Now we have four CH3s, but to make room, one of them becomes a CH2. Okay? This is called neopentyl. This has special properties that we're going to see later when we look at the SN2 reaction. This is a benzene ring where we've taken off one of the hydrogens and now we're attached to something else, and it's called phenyl. And then this is a benzene ring with a CH2 and we're attached to CH2, this is called benzyl. So these are the common names of uh, substituent groups that you're gonna need to memorize. And um, we will see these being used in our class and in standardized exams and in homework and so forth. In the next section, we're going to look at how we deal with molecules that have more than one functional group in them. So we call these molecules polyfunctional molecules. When at least two of the groups are not on saturations, then only the highest priority group would be the main functional group. So what we must do is treat the other groups as substituents.
So here's another version of the table from earlier. We've added a column. So again, the functional groups are arranged in order of priority from highest to lowest. And again, these are only the functional groups we're going to learn to name in first semester. You can see in the far right hand column that we have a, a different name for when the groups are substituents from when they are the main functional group. One thing to point out is that in this list, carboxylic acid would always be the highest priority group, and so it would never be treated as a substituent. But aldehydes and ketones are both called oxo, which is to indicate where the C double bond O carbonyl carbon is, and alcohols are called hydroxies, which is an abbreviation for the OH. Here are a couple of examples of naming molecules that have uh, two or more substituents in them. Here's another example of naming molecules that have two or more different functional groups in them. So if we look at our first molecule, we have a carboxylic acid and we have an alcohol. If we look at the table, the carboxylic acid would be the higher priority, so we will call it the main functional group, which I'll just abbreviate MFG. Therefore, the alcohol functional group is lower priority, so we're going to have to treat it as a substituent. So what we're going to do is treat the OH as the substituent, and we're going to give that the name hydroxy. So we number the carbon chain, we get the parent name, pent. It has no double bond, so it's ain. We drop the E. We put the ending on for the main functional group, oic acid. And then we put the name of the hydroxy, or the alcohol substituent, in front with the number where it's attached, so 3-hydroxy. If we look at our second example, what we have is one, two, three, four, five, six carbons with an aldehyde and a ketone. So aldehyde has higher priority, so it becomes the main functional group. And ketone is the substituent. To name the aldehyde and the parent chain, we have six carbons, so it's a hex. We add the suffix "-n", because it's uh, Un, it has no unsaturations, and then we add AL for the ending uh, uh, indicating an aldehyde is the main functional group. Then for the ketone, what we do is we find the number of the carbon of the carbonyl, in other words, the C double bond O carbon, of the ketone that we're treating as a substituent. So in this case, that would be carbon 5 right here. So we use that number plus the prefix oxo to indicate that we have this C double bond O oxo group at carbon 5. Now, it is important that we use oxo, not oxa with an A, because oxa with an A is also used in naming, although we're not going to cover it now, and we don't want to confuse the two.